Now our squash has been sweated and it is ready to go from cubes of squash into mustard pickles. Yay! Okay, this is a canning project. So if you are new to canning, keep watching. If you're not new to canning, still keep watching because you may not have exact same procedures. Um, this is a fun project. We're going to use uh, this calls for water bath canning. So this is a pressure canner, but that, that can also be used for water bath. If you do not have one of these, you can still do this project. One of these being a great big heavy duty pot that you can seal the lid on and pressurize the container. That's what you need for uh, pressure canning, which I do a lot when it comes to tomatoes and some of your other non-acidic foods. Uh, acidic meaning vinegar, lemon juice, jams and stuff, high in sugar are acidic. So you can use a water bath, which is a lower temperature version of canning. Whereas with pressure canning, you not just put the lid on, you put the lid on, turn up the heat and add pressure. Once you add pressure, the same amount of heat gets even higher than it would if you had just water boiling. Hence, you can kill bacteria if you're not doing, like, there's two major ways to kill bacteria and preserve, preserve your food for long periods of time. One of them is acid. Think when you're cleaning, you use bleach. You cannot ingest bleach. So you use acidic things that you can ingest, which include vinegar, sugar. Salt is not acidic, but it does also act as a preservative. And then you, put your jars in the canner, add boiling water, and that combination of boiling acids will create a, a seal and also kill bacteria in the food so you can store it for long periods of time. So, first things first, with our canners, water bath canning, I have already sterilized my jars. Some people like to store them, uh, like heat them up in the oven before they can. Mine came out of the dishwasher recently, which sterilized them. So I'm going to put them in the canner, add water with this. If we can get a shot into the pot, we need to fill each jar more than 50% full and bring the overall water level more than 50% of the jars when there's no food in them because once we have the jars filled and back in the pot, we need at least an inch of water covering everything uh, for a water bath canning process. Pressure canning is different and we'll cover it on a different video, but for this particular process, you need a big enough a pot where you can put your jars in and add water to more than, it, it, once you have your jars in and full, you have room for at least an inch of water and then space above it because you are gonna be heating that water up. I'm taking my jars more than halfway full, close to the top, and then I will take the surrounding water level to more than 50% of the jars, about three quarters of it, and that will give me more than enough water because as this heats up, water will also be evaporating off. And I like to make allowances for that. All right, we have water in our canner. If you're using a pressure canner, this is a Presto pressure canner, you're gonna see that there is a front and a back side of your canner. This little tab, I always wanna to keep toward me when I'm putting it on the oven. So I'm gonna switch that back around so it's facing toward me. And this is my arm workout. I like to put, you could put your, your canners on a front burner. I prefer to use the back burner for my canners because I'm not gonna be doing much with that. I'm gonna go ahead and turn up the heat to medium. If I felt like I was ready to be working in turbo speed, I'd turn it up to high, but on a gas stove, that will bring this to a hard boil very quickly, and I don't quite want that. I don't want water boiling all over the place while I'm getting glass jars out of the canner. I want it to be at a nice simmer so the glass is hot when I put the hot filling in, and then the lids are gonna be hot. 
you don't want anything cold. When you have things that are different, when there's a te temperature differential, that's when jars break, especially, definitely when they're flawed, but even if it's not flawed, if there's no little weird thing about the glass, it will shatter on you if it is cold and you suddenly dunk it in boiling water. We don't want that. So, the other things you're going to need, you're gonna need a whisk and some sort of ladle. You're gonna need a couple of kitchen towels and a, this is just a washcloth, I've used it historically as a painting rack, but you just need a washcloth. If you just got into canning, this is where we learn how to use all of our cool little gizmos that came in the canning kit. Very important is a funnel. Um, we have ingredients, we'll get to those in one moment, but I wanna make sure you have your space set up. So, I take one towel, this towel, is where I'm going to be filling my hot jars. You want to protect your counters and your glass jars by not putting them directly on the counter. You need this buffer and a kitchen towel really is just the right size if we're going to be doing eight jars right here that fits nicely on here. Even when I'm doing bigger runs and using both canners simultaneously, I just use one kitchen towel here. I'm going to leave this rag here. We're going to get it wet. And just water for this. If you're doing a meat product, you're gonna use vinegar on this rag, but we're not. We're just doing, this is pickles. We want water on the rag. So this, this other towel, we're gonna be ready for our finished products. They need to set, they need to sit here and set up for at least 24 hours after you remove them from the canner. Those lids need a chance to really seal to the jars. So I always set up a place, and I like to work from left to right. In your kitchen, you may have it somewhere else, but you just need a space set aside where you know you're gonna be able to leave them alone for 24 hours. All right, ingredients. How in the world do we take this to this? All right, first off, if you have not, if you're new to canning, this is gonna be a new product to you. You may be familiar with cornstarch, which this is a form of cornstarch. It's specialized and formulated for use in high temperatures. There are several brands of it. Um, I get mine online, but you can find it at Walmart and the grocery store. Um, we, and if you look at it, see, it looks identical, identical to cornstarch. It is more expensive than cornstarch. Um, we are gonna need a quarter cup of it. And this one, uh, I don't do the same way I measure flour. I just scoop it straight out. Put it in your pot. This is a bigger pot than what I need for this particular project, but it's better to go bigger than smaller because you're gonna heat this to boiling. And as you can see, it's about the same consistency as powdered sugar. It won't hurt you if it gets on anything. Um, this is what's gonna thicken. Yeah, this is clear gel. It is cornstarch that has been specially formulated for canning. It is what's gonna, that's what makes the liquid into this gel. All right, so next we need sugar. There are several types of sugar that you can use. One moment. For this recipe, I'm using a very small amount. I'm just gonna use white sugar. You can use unrefined sugar. I've seen some people uh, use versions of honey for it. I'm not as big of a fan of it. It's not a one-for-one -one substitution. Uh, and it has, it, honey is influenced by the bees that, you know, that create it, and it can have other chemicals in there that may interact funny with once you add acid and heat it. Um, so, quarter cup of white sugar. There we go. Now, we already did the salt because that was put into the squash when we, when we made it sweat. 
So no more salt. There's enough salt in there. But we do need our spices. We are going to need a whole bunch of yellow mustard. I actually buy whole seed yellow mustard and then grind it as I need it. But, you know, whatever you have on hand will probably work. We need a whole quarter cup of that. That is part of what makes these particular pickles zippy and contributes a little bit to the yellow color. Surprisingly, most of our yellow color comes from turmeric, which also has anti-inflammatory properties and is great for your digestive system as well as your immune system. And it makes it pretty yellow. Next, we need ginger, which is also excellent for your digestive system. And it's also chock full of gingerol, which is a type of antioxidant and flavonoid. So we will just add that yummy goodness to our mix. And I like mine a little bit more on the spicy side than the straight sweet side. So, you could just use some paprika if you'd like, but I prefer to use a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. Uh, crushed red pepper also works. Smoked papri paprika works. If you're using paprika, you could go up to like two teaspoons and it would be fine. Uh, however, once you preserve a pepper, in the vinegar, as it ages, it will get hotter and hotter. So better to be on the conservative side. And if it's not hot enough when you open it, give it another month or two, like on the next jar, wait another month or two before you open it. And it will be spicier simply because this red pepper will get hotter the longer it sits in the vinegar solution that is pickled. So I believe we have our dry ingredients. This next step is important. I'm taking a stiff whisk and I'm going to whisk all of this together. I haven't added any heat yet. I'm trying to get it all fairly evenly distributed because once I add liquid to this and add heat, it's gonna move, things are gonna need to move quickly. Okay. So, here we are, we're going over, and I'm going to use the other thing that we got set up were our lids. They are just in room temperature water right now. We need to heat them up, not to boiling, to almost a simmer. And because I want them to heat up quickly and they're on a fairly big burner, I'm putting it on low. If you're using a conventional stove top, it's more likely gonna be closer to medium for this. That's gonna be, as you get to know your stove. Sorry, my gas stove is ticking at me. All right, so now we are ready to add heat. I am putting it on medium low. Our first liquid ingredient that we're going to add is two cups of white distilled vinegar. I've, I've seen some people use apple cider vinegar for this and it will change the flavor a little bit. Um, I just use white. And then we're gonna need one half cup of water. Or four ounces. And grab that whisk again. See, so now, right now it's liquid. This is going to turn into a gel that looks more like pie filling consistency very quickly as we heat it up. It's loud, I'm sorry. Now, this is an aluminum pot, but it's a treated aluminum pot, which is important because I'm cooking something acidic in it. Uh, you don't want to use untreated aluminum with acidic foods because it can change the flavor of your food. If you have stainless steel, that's awesome. If you have like the ceramic coated or Teflon coated, that'll be fine too. Just 
be careful if you have the, the coated pans with using a wire whisk. Okay, I'm going to turn my back on this for just a moment because we need to start draining our fabulous mixture of onions and yellow squash. You see the fluid pouring out. This is the awkward part. You don't want to rinse it, not at this stage. We actually want everything that's still on there. Okay. And we want this ready so that once our sauce has gelled up, we can add it and heat everything up. I'm gonna rinse my hands off. Okay. I'm just gonna leave it in the colander for one moment and we're back to our pot. Another stir. <laughs> This is the exciting part. At this point, if you want it a little bit sweeter, I like to add stevia to make to up the sweet and spicy aspect of this particular pickle. I'm going to add two teaspoons, which if I were using granulated sugar, that would be equivalent to two cups of sugar. Um, However, in my goals to be less is more as far as added sweeteners, um, I've been trying to cut back on that. Now, in canning, sugar really is one of your preservatives, so you need to be careful if you're using other sweeteners to replace sugar. In this particular uh, project, acid is our primary preserver in the vinegar, so we have more flexibility as far as what we can use for sweeteners. I am waiting for this to thicken. It's getting close. Oh, and if we take the camera to my small pot, you see those bubbles? I'm gonna turn the power, uh, turn the burner off and then keep the lid on so they, those stay hot. Again, not boiling, but really hot. And then we can take another look. We can see, you can see a little bit of steam coming off of our jars, which is good. That means they're warming up and I can still kind of lightly touch the pot. Um, they are warming up and they should be perfect for filling by the time I get the filling ready for that. Please excuse the sound of the fan. If you are using a gas stove, make sure you have your fan running while you have the gas on. And it, it takes icky, fumes from your gas, from your natural gas, and sucks them out of the house and keeps everything safe. So, please excuse the sound, but it is an important step, and if you have a gas stove, remember to turn yours off. This is coming. I do not want to add my squash in before it starts to thicken. If I add it, my squash too soon, the gel won't form evenly and you'll get clumps that are, it's like this clump of just goo that you hit and then you hit a bite of squash and runniness. At, so it's very important to wait for the gel to form before you add your solid, whether it's squash or if you're doing pie filling, this is the exact same process you would use for doing app, preserving apple pie filling or peach pie filling, any of that. You wanna make sure your roux or your sauce has thickened before you add your solids to it. So what's so cool about this and why I bothered to learn how to process food like this is that it doesn't fill my freezer, but it lets me enjoy stuff that was grown from the garden um, at peak season and preserve it at its best and eat it throughout the rest of the year without putting added burden on, like adding yet another fridge or another freezer. Um, it, and it gives me some homemade shortcuts where I know what's in them. I know what preservatives are in them. Uh, I know that they're seasoned the way I want them seasoned. So I can cook later and have some shortcuts to come out, like mixing 
the jar of mustard pickles with a jar a quart of beans and then cooking rice and bam, I've got an easy meal. Or if I throw this in with a few bags of frozen vegetables and a couple quarts of marinara sauce and maybe noodles, I've got a really yummy vegetable soup. I don't want to step away from this for much longer because it has to be stirred constantly. And once it starts forming the gel, it's going to be very, very quick. And I'll feel, if you are doing this right along with me, you're going to start feeling resistance on your whisk. And that's how you know it's time to add your, uh, your yellow squash or your cucumbers or zucchini, whatever you're using to make these pickles and get them coated in the sauce. So not with this particular pickle, not only are we getting the awesome nutrition from yellow squash, you're also getting the uh, the antioxidants and other nutri nutritional benefits for turmeric, cayenne pepper, ginger, mustard seed, which is, a, it's like the variety pack of flavonoids and other antioxidants, which have help fight cancer, uh, anti-aging, make your gut healthier, all kinds of good things. Oh, I see it. You see the gel? It's coming. It's right around the boiling point where it starts to gel. So you be paying close attention because this stuff will scorch to the bottom of your pan very quickly. Yep, starting to drag. See how it's moving more slowly? Almost there. It's getting to be not nearly as liquid. Okay, I'm gonna turn the heat off for a moment. Grab my squash. Squash is coming. The squash and the onions. Remember, I already added the salt, so no more salt added. And make sure if you're doing any preserving, you do not use iodized table salt. You need to have canning salt. Sea salt can also be used, although I prefer canning salt simply because sea salt you have added chemicals, and now I'm gonna turn the heat back on. I really did not want it to scorch. Now I'm up at about medium, because I've gotta get this squash to warm up. Scooping it around. It smells so good. It'll clear your sinuses too, because the ginger uh, is actually awesome for sinus issues. But yeah, between the mustard, the ginger, and the cayenne pepper, uh, just breathing it in, I'm like, oh. Now, interestingly, that particular flavor combination is used a lot in several types of Asian cuisine. So you can safely throw this into some stir fries or if you're doing lentils to create an Indian dal, this is really good with it. It won't fight with it because so much of their seasonings include ginger, turmeric, pepper, it just, it doesn't fight with it, it simply enhances it. Now this really, a mustard pickles from what I can tell are kind of an American farming, almost Midwestern type of traditional food, but it's really super awesome for you and it, it really also flows into several other types of cuisine, which is kind of neat when you're trying to keep things interesting and your diet varied and learn about, you know, the way the rest of the world eats. So, no, this is not an Indian recipe, nor is it Vietnamese or Chinese or anything like that. But it, if you're making that style of food for a meal, you can throw this in with it and it'll taste really good. Okay, I am going to put the lid on so it heats up faster. I got the gel mixed in very well so all of our squash is coated if you look at it look at that color 
And again, just that one teaspoon of turmeric for all of that squash gives it all that golden color. So cool. Um, I'm gonna get some of my other stuff off the sides. chunky stuff in. Okay, so while we're heating this up, I want to talk to you a little bit about your canner. If you're using a stock pot, chances are hopefully you have some sort of shelf in the bottom because that will keep your jars from resting directly on the superheated metal. That's, su that's very important because again, anytime you have a dramatic temperature difference between your glass and whatever it's surrounded by, that's when you really have cracking and exploding problems. And we don't, we don't want those, we wanna avoid those. So whether you're using a, an actual canning pot or a huge stock pot, make sure you have something in the bottom that is a buffer or insulation between your jars and the bottom of the pan. We have that. And it, this'll be ready for when I do my next batch. This is just a single batch. Now, there are, bunches of canning pots on the market. I use this particular one. It looks a little bit deep for this with this project, but the advantage of getting a 23 quart uh, canning pot versus say a 16 quart is that when I'm doing pressure canning things like tomato paste, where I want the same 16 ounce jar, I can actually take an extra tray and I call it double deckering, uh, like a double decker bus. I'm, I'm not quite sure. D double stacking. You stack a whole nother round of eight pints on top of the first one when you're pressure canning, and it really increases how fast you can get these projects done. That's why I went ahead and got a much larger canning pot. Um, but again, it's up to you know, it's up to you what you have and what you can get your hands on. All right. Good, I see bubbles in my mustard pickles. I'm gonna give that a little stir and I am momentarily gonna remove it from heat. I'm gonna leave it on the heat long enough for me to get the jar out of the canner. They are hot, so I'm going to use this nifty jar grabber tool as you can see, I've gotten a lot of use out of it. You, as you get going, will get a lot of use out of yours too. Grab, pour the water out. Put it right back in the pan, in the pot. We need that water. Uh, if you can see the steam, these are hot jars. Which is exactly what we need. The only part of this project that we don't need to heat before we use it are the rings or the bands, and that is because they're aluminum and they heat up as soon as you put them on. So you don't need to preheat them. Now, the lids we had to preheat in water because it actually makes the little sticky ring on the end, just on the inside of them tacky it activates that to create a better seal. And you're gonna see my leftiness in this part of the process. Varieties, you may find you work the opposite direction and that's just fine. Okay, funnel. There we go. I am going to turn the heat, the burner off. And this one's okay. See, now if I'm doing a full pot of this, by the time the all of the squash pickle mixture gets up to this, I can't touch the handles anymore. But because it's such a small batch, I'm good. Okay, now we fill the jars. See the benefit of the funnel yet? They're great. Now, I am using a wide mouth jar. Um, I have both ball and cur. I believe they come off the same production lines. 
There are several brands of jars that you can use. I prefer for pickling projects like this, I prefer the wide mouth. I think they're a little bit easier to work with, but you can certainly do this in what's called a regular mouth jar. It's just, it's not a straight down thing. The, the, the mouth of your jar is actually, it's a smaller diameter than the diameter of your, the main part of your jar. So it's, it's easier to get air bubbles. And air bubbles are not your friend. You do not want air bubbles in these. Air bubbles can also cause broken jars. Uh -oh. Because what does air do when it when you heat it? It expands, and then you have more pressure inside your jar than the outside, and you have science project gone wrong inside your canning pot, and no food. Ooh. That part's no good. All right. So I am what I would call is rough draft filling the jars. I'm gonna go back after I get pretty much everything in. And then I will make adjustments on the jars. Keep in mind the burner, so what burners are on on my stove right now, my burner for my canning pot is the only one that is currently on. Everything else I've turned off. My lids are nice and hot and waiting for me. I do not want to keep the burner on my pickle mixture because otherwise there's a very good chance it will scorch the bottom of the pot while I'm doing things like scooping it out. Now, there is no particular order that you need to fill the jars in. You could do tic-tac-toe and that would be just fine. It's whatever works for you. When I'm dealing with liquids, I tend to like to work my way away from the pot um, just because of where the drips land. But this is chunky and it's not really gonna run over. So I'm not as concerned with that with this. Now, with this mixture, if I have any jars that are not full to the level where I need them, I will not put them in the canner. Not with this one, um, because otherwise it can explode. But this one might turn out to be exact. Which is what you're aiming for when you do this, but things, aren't, things don't always work out as exactly as you'd like. Now I'm going to work to level them a bit. See, I have a few, where's my, ah. a tablespoon measuring spoon is excellent for this. It's just about the right volume, regardless of what project you're doing. It's a handy one to have for this final step of getting everything where you need it before you put the lid on. All right, now you're going to see why I had you get a damp rag ready. We are ready to wipe and then put the lids on. Now, if you get look closely at this ring, do you see that food that's right there on the lid? This part of the of your jar is the part that makes contact and creates the seal with your lid. You don't want any food in there because when you do not have a perfect tight seal, either A, it won't seal at all, or B, it will look like it's sealed, but a few months down the road, you're gonna have bacteria creeping into your jar and then it's just gross. And that's how you have food spoilage and you do not wanna eat spoiled food. So, wiping each of them. But that's part of the reason why we start with a funnel and then come back and wipe. It also gets it damp, which will help enhance the seal when you put the damp lid on. Okay, we're on to this tool. This is a magnet on the end of a long stick. 
it is for getting these jars. Now I grabbed two. You can shake it till you're down to one. I'm okay with putting one on. These are hot. So I'm just barely touching them, placing them on. Now, if you would like, you can use this nifty little tool to hold your jar while you put the ring on. Um, I, I have, I'm very, yeah, if, if you feel things and you go, ow, that's hot, and you don't wanna touch it, use this tool. I have what I refer to as asbestos fingers. All right, see the steam coming off? That's good, that's right where we want these lids. Not boiling, but nice and hot. So that brown ring gets tacky. There we go. And, oh, I got one lid that time, yay. So now we have hot lids going on warm jars that were filled with warm filling. In this case, mustard pickles. We want everything nice and hot. So next are the rings. They just need to be finger tightened and they don't need to be pretty. You can use these for years. See, like that's gotta be a newer one. It doesn't have any oxidation or rust spots, but it'll work fine with the rust spots as long as it hasn't been bent. Let's see, it's hot. All right, and just finger tight. You don't want to you know, grab a wrench and tighten them that much. There needs to be movement once they're in the water bath canner that the seal is created by that lid just barely going up and down inside the ring until, and you know, it's done. This will process for 10 minutes. So all my jars are going back in. If I had ice cold filling, this is when my jars would start cracking. Um, might have the bottom of a jar fill out, fall out at this point if there's a flaw on it when it hits the hot water, flaw in it. Once it's filled and it hits the hot water, that flaw that was invisible to you becomes apparent when the bottom falls out of your jar. All right. We have our canner. With this particular brand, you line up your little arrows. So you put it on offset. Line up your arrows and then twist it to seal it. And now I'm gonna turn up my heat. I don't do anything else to this pot. Now, we need to take it all the way to a full boil. With this particular brand canner, you know you have a full, healthy rolling boil. When this little round thing says has the word top etched in it, it'll pop up because this, the force of the steam will, will make it pop up and you'll also see steam escaping from the pressure valve. Uh, with water bath canning, you start your timer for processing of your food when it hits the boiling mark when this little bobber pops up. <laughs> so we'll give it a minute. I'm going to move my jar. See, look how nice that volume worked out. So this was eight pints of finished pickles is what we're gonna get out of it. But again, it took 20 pints, no, yeah, almost 20 pints of raw onions and squash, and it cooks down that far. So five quarts is, is the volume that I was going for to get eight pints. So keep, keep that in mind, it takes a lot of squash, but by the same token, it's a great way to use up a lot of squash. And then it saves it and it really packs the flavor in for these um, typically water dense fruits and vegetables like cucumbers and squash. Um, it makes them more flavorful because you're taking a little bit of that volume out. And then as it heats up and the vinegar also helps open it up, each bite will be soaking in the flavor of the spices that you put in it. In this case, you have a sweetener being sugar and stevia. You've got ginger, which brings heat not necessarily spicy, 
not the same as a cayenne spicy, but heat. And then you've got turmeric, which gives it a little bit of an earthy flavor, as well as the yellow color. You've got mustard, which is a little bit of the yellow, but mostly that tart flavor. And then you've got your cayenne pepper for zip. So as we wait for this, you'll be able to hear it. Like I can hear it starting to boil. Once we get this to the full rolling boil, you let it process, and they call it process regarding what, regardless of what cookbook or, or website you go to, it's called the processing time. For this, this particular project, it's very short in my perspective, it's only 10 minutes. Set your timer when it pops up for 10 minutes, and then at the 10 minute mark, you turn off your burner, and then you leave it alone. With water bath canners, you can open them up as soon as this thing has popped back down, and then you can take your stuff out. It's different with pressure canning, but we'll cover that in a different video when we're actually pressure canning something. Water bath, I, if you are new to canning and you're like, yes, this is the time for me to try it, start with pickles, start with jam, things that you can do with water bath canning so you understand the heat, the safety features, how to use the lids, the rings, all of these little tools. So this one again was to hold the jars like a clamp so you could put the rings on. These tongs, I grew up thinking these things were for hot dogs, but they come in the canning set because you can grab the empty jars out with them. Um, it's just a different way. I prefer the full jar grabber one, but I certainly have this option. When I am canning, everyone in the household knows if I'm having trouble finding one of these three tools. These three are the most important ones. Your funnel, your magnet, because you do not want to get burned getting your lids out of the hot water, and the special shaped jar grabber. And I'm just waiting for this to boil so that you can see what it looks like. Come on. It's coming. You see it's starting to splutter. So for water bath, you don't even need to worry about this gauge. This has to do with once you pressurize the pot and you have to bring it to particular pressures for different foods. It's just starting to kind of spit. So exciting. It'll start spitting here and then the increased steam pressure will start putting pressure on the underside of this little valve. So here is one escape valve, and the other one's right here. Um, different brand pressure canners are, good, are gonna have different valve spots, but they have to have these release valves. So regardless of what brand you're using, it's gonna have that. Now, you may, I don't know if you could see it, but this little plastic stopper, this is like the emergency safety valve. Um, that's it. If this thing gets stuck, that thing is clogged. So if the chimney is clogged and then the steam pressure valve also gets stuck, then there's an emergency safety valve on the back and the, the steam pressure will pop that little plastic thing out. And eventually, if you turn off the heat underneath it, you're good. But we are almost to the point where that's gonna pop up. And then we can set our timer for 10 minutes. Come on. Have my heat all the way up on high. For um, water bath canning, you want to keep your heat on high the entire time. So once I set my timer, I don't do anything to this until that timer goes off. And at that point, I turn off the heat and let it start naturally cooling down. And you'll know it's going to be safe to touch when this valve that's going to pop up in just a minute goes back down. And at that point, I still give it another 10 minutes at least, and I will carefully, I'll show you on this one. So, while we're waiting for that to boil. So we'll pretend this one was boiling, boiling, boiling. The timer went off. I, re I turn off the burner, wait, and after everything has calmed down, nothing's popped up anymore, I take my lid, and I may use pot holders. 
I turn it carefully, keep it facing away from you because there is there's going to be a bunch of steam coming out. Aim it away from your face. Shake it a little bit because there's going to be a bunch of water on the bottom of the lid and carefully place it to the side. And I let the rest of the steam escape because you're going to have steam going everywhere. I have the fan on just because it introduces a bunch of humidity to the room. Let it cool for a couple more minutes and then get your tongs and start grabbing the jars out and placing them on your towel. And look, we have action. Come on. This part's always exciting. So we have a steady stream of steam coming from, I'm gonna call it the chimney. When we're pressure canning, that's where we place the weight. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. This is the part where we learn to have patience our canning process. Come on. You don't want to start your timer early either. It really needs to be at that full boil to maximize the germ killing time, basically. That's what this boiling is for. It's to kill germs. There we go. And there it is. So this is the steam pressure has made that pop up. I have And at the 10 minute mark, I turn my burner off and leave it alone. Don't touch anything until after our little steam valve goes back down. Um, that's usually at least 15, 20 minutes after you turn the burner off. All right, enjoy.